So today we have Anton presenting. The topic is uh, uh, the Constitution, in particular the, uh, the, the federalism aspect of the Constitution, and in particular again, uh, a line of cases, a doctrine that was developed by Owen Dixon uh, that dealt with uh, intergovernmental immunities, so the allocation of powers between uh, the states and the national government in a federation. Um, and I'm holding up a book by uh, Philip Hares. Um, Jeffrey Phillips actually gave that to me and I was hoping he'd be here today because I wanted to welcome him back to the floor. Um, for those of you who haven't met him, he's a, he's a great guy, so much fun. So it's really great to have Jeffrey back and uh, that was his uh, a gift to me after I completed my, my uh, readership with, with Jeffrey, so that was, that was good of him. Uh, it's a great book, not written by a lawyer, so it's a lot about his uh, life and upbringing, but uh, Anton will touch upon that. My favourite little um, snippets out of it are that uh, in the 1880s, just after he was born, he used to ride his horse to school. So he had a very Victorian upbringing, not just Victorian in the state sense, but uh, in the regal sense. He, um, he wasn't a, uh, a great scholar at school. He, he didn't excel. He, I think he got second class honours, Anton, correct me if I'm wrong, in his arts degree. And he didn't receive any honours at all in his law degree. Um, and so poorly did he perform that he, in fact, didn't uh, undertake articles with anyone. He couldn't afford to and um, none were offered on the basis of his results. But nevertheless, um, as they say in the classics, the rest was history. Um, I just want to, by way of introduction on the, um, on the topic, uh, talk about some aspects of, of federalism. Um, as you might know, the whole uh, compact in Australia was struck, uh, the bargain was, was really struck in the 1890s, early 1890s, um, on the Hawkesbury River on a, on a boat, a yacht called the Lucinda, where some of the founding fathers met and they did a deal as to what the new nation would look like. And that didn't come to fruition for another decade, of course, but nevertheless, that was, um, that was the, uh, the seminal uh, moment in the, in the history of the constitutional conventions. Um, now, ever since that time, we've been debating exactly what that deal was. Was it a compact between a bunch of states who decided to come together and, uh, for reasons of security and, and unity and the like? Thank you, Stephen. Oh, you're right. Um, was it a deal amongst a bunch of states that came together and uh, had an agreement as to what the national government would like, look like? Uh, that's the federalism view of the Constitution. Uh, was it a deal uh, between the people of Australia uh, in the sense that the people voted in, in referenda in every colony and they finally agreed to what the Constitution would look like. Um, that is a view which sees uh, Section 128 of the Constitution as the grand norm, the basic norm of, of uh, where the source of power is in the Constitution. Um, or was it really a document forged in uh, the halls of Westminster? Is it a, a statute of the of the British Parliament. And those three competing views have at various times uh, gained ascendancy in, in the High Court. I think in the, it's fair to say um, uh, justices like Murphy saw that the, uh, the people, 128, were the real source of the law. Um, and uh, then into the Gleeson Court, we really saw uh, the ascendancy of the idea that we're really dealing with a common law compact that was an enactment of the, of the English Parliament. Um, but now, and Anton will, will touch upon this, now we're starting to see the uh, understanding that it was a, a compact between the colonies and that you can't um, discount the idea of uh, federalism when you're interpreting the Constitution. Sections 106 to 108 um, are predicated on the fact that the states will continue in their existence and that has to be reconciled always with Section 109 of the Constitution which gives primacy to uh, Commonwealth laws over state laws. They're rendered invalid to the extent of any inconsistency. The question is, once the Commonwealth, the National Parliament, has, is given that much power to render um, state laws inconsistent, 
how do you guarantee the continued existence of the states? And this is where uh, Dixon comes in in the Melbourne Corporation case. After this idea that there was any reserved powers to the states, after that idea was exploded in the engineers case in the 1920s, um, the Commonwealth power had its ascendancy, uh, it took over state debts, um, issues of taxation and the like were uh, at the fore. Uh, but then Dixon comes along and following a doctrine that was developed in, in the US, the US also has um, in the 10th Amendment a, uh, a reservation of state powers um, provision. Uh, he breathed life back into this idea that the states have to continue on as, uh, well he used the word sovereign but they're not really sovereign, but as sovereign entities. So if you have uh, a national law that goes to the very heart of the existence of a state, this is ex existential stuff, then that law will be invalid, notwithstanding that it's validly made by the Commonwealth Parliament. Um, our floor member, um, <coughs> Richard Kenzie, actually did the biggest, most seminal case following Melbourne Corporation on that very issue in 1995. He, he won the case except for one issue in which uh, he lost on, uh, and that was a case called re -AEU. Um He was uh, arguing that a, a federal award took primacy, oh sorry, that sought to cover um, public servants in Victoria, took, took primacy over any state laws. The Victorian uh, state appeared in the High Court and said, well you can't do that, you're talking about our, our own government workers, we've got to have the right to regulate them and you can't do that through a, re a federal instrument that sort of renders inconsistent anything that we say or do. Now they lost on that point, except for in respect of one particular area, um, which is where the Melbourne Corporation case comes in. And that area was actually a submission made by the State of South Australia. The South, South, State of South Australia said, what about when it comes to numbers and identities of people in the public sector? So if you have a, a federal award that deals with uh, redundancies and termination provisions, that might allow a third party, through the force of the federal award, to determine the size of your public sector. It might determine who you can and can't dismiss, and therefore determine the size of government. And the High Court said, yes, we'll accept that submission. Once you start talking about numbers and identity of who you can employ, then that goes to the very heart of your sovereign power. Um, and, and that was, as I say, a, a doctrine that was developed by uh, Owen Dixon in the Melbourne Corporation case. So Anton will no doubt expand upon that. Um, and if you haven't had a chance to read that, I know I only distributed it about an hour ago. It's a wonderful paper. So Anton. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Thank you for delivering my paper, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a couple of uh, props here to go through as well. Um, the, the view that I've that I've taken is, is the interplay of history, politics and law. And the paper deals a little bit with the fact that the law developed along with the historical issues at the time. So 1920, we come to engineers, we've just come through the fire of the First World War, uh, Melbourne corporations with regard to um, uh, uh, nationalisation of banking, Again, we've come out of the Second World War and, and Labor's looking to do things. Um, so, the, so the interplay of politics, history and law is, is fascinating. In Just very briefly, I just want to share with you a comment by Geoffrey Sawyer um, in a wonderful book called Australian Federal Politics and Law, 1929 to 1949. Fascinating reading. But in, in my uh, research, I just want to share with you um, uh, this comment. And then you can tell me if it has any, any resonance with a, another issue from, from late last year. And um, Sawyer's talking about the constitutional issue of, of, of the bank nationalisation debate. Um, and he says that the, the Labor government resisted demands for a plebiscite on bank nationalisation um, on the grounds inter alia that referenda could only be held for the purpose of constitutional change under 128 of the Constitution. A view that, if sound, would have made the 1916-17 uh, plebiscites on conscription unlawful. So there's some basis for the argument the Commonwealth Parliament cannot, 
bring the electors into the process of legislation by making their assent necessary to the enactment of particular laws. So we've just had one of those debates and there's nothing new in politics. Plebiscites 1949, 1916, 17, we had the debate last year on same-sex marriage. Very interesting book. Okay, well, I just want to um, start off with a bit about um, Sir Owen Dixon um, himself. Um, and the span of Owen Dixon's life was quite incredible from, 19, from 1886 uh, through to when he died in 1972. That's a hell of a period of time uh, to be alive. And uh, Ayers writes in his book that at the time in Melbourne when he was born, there were no telegraph poles in Melbourne. There's no electricity in Melbourne. There's gas that lights the Melbourne streets. And there are hansom cabs that drive the streets. There were no cars. So by the time Dixon passes away in 1972, he's seen two world wars, he's seen the incredible development of the Commonwealth, um, and uh, uh, he's also been involved in politics, war, and he's been to the United States as the Minister uh, for uh, the Commonwealth as well. Now, as Tom indicated, um, Sir Owen's father was a barrister as well, but Sir Owen's father had a problem with the drink. And Sir Owen would often have to go home and take care of uh, his father. Indeed, he started in his father's practice, but that went downhill in the 1890s. Um, and uh, Owen Dixon really didn't have a job uh, any longer. So he studied and worked in order to keep the family going. Hence, one reason why he didn't serve in the First World War is because of um, his, his family, family issues. Um, he was admitted as a barrister on the 1st of March, 1910, um, and he should have been reading at the Melbourne Bar, but that cost somewhere between 50 and 100 guineas, and I haven't been able to, to determine how much that would be, but that was your starting fee to start uh, at the bar. He started at a place called Selborne Chambers, and again in the Robert Menzies book, there's a picture of Selborne Chambers, so I'll, I'll just pass that uh, around. So you can see exactly what um, we would have been doing back in the uh, 1900s. It kind of looks like the Strand Arcade where you wander around and you can look down and, um, and, and yell at people. And in fact, that's what apparently a lot of people did, in fact, calling out various ideas of your skill and competence in the law and your general uh, parentage. Now, um, just two things before I get onto the paper. Um, Dixon was not a person that you would want to spend much time with. Um, he was described as prickly, vain, and humorless. Uh, he, the one thing that he had going for him was he had a phenomenal memory. He had a photographic memory and he could remember every case that he'd read. Quite a handy skill uh, to have. Um, in fact, he was so, so successful that he uh, became uh, a silk in 1922, 12 years after starting at the bar, and he'd appeared in his first High Court case 18 months after joining the bar. So he was, uh, he was quite, a, um, quite a talented uh, man. Okay, so the, the, the paper that has been distributed, um, I'll go through, but I'll, I'll draw some of the historical issues because they're, they're also very interesting and very important. Uh, now, now, Dixon had served on the court in 19, from 1929, uh, so that means that he'd been senior counsel at, in 1922 and seven years later is on the High Court. He was, he was uh, an extreme prodigy. Uh, and he lasted on the High Court bench becoming the Chief Justice in 1952 and retiring in 1964. So he's seen a, a great swathe of uh, change over that time. Now, as Tom has indicated, the Constitution started with a very, very slow development. The people that were on the bench took a very limited view of what the Constitution of Australia provided, and I'll go through a little bit of why that may be the case. So Dixon comes in in 1920, 
uh, sorry, Engineers comes in in 1920, and Engineers is a seminal case, and I'll go through a few of those uh, issues. Just think about where Australia would have been in 1886 and leading up to the convention debates. Australia was a, was, was a theory. There was no conception of what Australia could be. We're still looking at jealousies between the states. Uh, and Robert Garron, in, in his book, says that when four men are on the boat in the Lucinda, cruising up the Hawkesbury, uh, they wrote the constitution in three days. The whole thing was done in 12. And Garron says that federation came down from the skies to the earth and from vague aspiration was crystallised into precise, uh, uh, precise planning uh, that was setting out the terms of the federal compact. So this is 1891, quite, a, uh, quite 10 years before uh, the Constitution was finally uh, brought in. It was meant to be one indissoluble Commonwealth. There is no method of getting out of the Commonwealth unless we are going to have some sort of constitutional debate. Now that has some relevance a bit later on in the 1930s when Western Australia votes to secede from the Commonwealth and they were not allowed uh, to leave. So think about the place down here at Macquarie Street. Think about the Melbourne Parliament due to geographic circumstances, uh, due to the isolation, due to the lack of communication. We were dealing with very, very separate colonies that had their own agendas and they had their own view of how their states were going to develop. And then along from Federation comes the Commonwealth, the new entity on the block. Now, how are we going to deal with this new entity? What does it mean? What does the Constitution actually mean for the development? The states had very carefully guarded, the, the states have very carefully guarded their powers, uh, and so the Constitution started off being developed quite narrowly. Now, the three men that started on the bench, Barton, O'Connor, and Griffiths, had all been big men within their own state legislatures. Barton had been Speaker of the, the, the House in New South Wales. Griffith had been a Premier of Queensland uh, and O'Connor had been a Minister. All of the state parliaments had the plenary power of the Mother Parliament. They had full plenary power to do what they saw that was fit within their jurisdictions. And then comes the Commonwealth. Dixon says at uh, one point in his book, Jesting Pilot, he says that it's quite remarkable that these three men who'd been instrumental in developing the Parliament of Australia, that, uh, and quote, it seemed to recede from the true principle of federal supremacy. So these three men that had such wonderful ideas for Australia, when they got to the bench, when they got to deciding, they favoured the states rather than the Commonwealth. I've cited a number of cases, Demden, Petter and Webb and Outram and a couple of other cases, but essentially what had transpired before then was the states saw in the Constitution an implied prohibition. The Commonwealth could not touch the states. The Commonwealth could not, within its power, do anything to harm the states. It was seen that they had a reserve power uh, under 107 of the Constitution which indicated that basically they wanted to keep all their powers. And it was such that the states had all their full plenary powers and the Commonwealth had the enumerated powers, the Section 51 powers. That view was challenged in 1920 and it was challenged in the engineers case. Uh, and as I've termed it in the paper, it's the, the flipping of the paradigm. We went from the states being senior and the Commonwealth being junior to the Commonwealth being senior and the states being uh, junior. Now one reason why that uh, happened was because of a change in personnel uh, at the top. So uh, in 1920 uh, you had Isaac Isaacs, you had Higgins on the bench, Barton had died, O'Connor had died, uh, so the people that had set the agenda were gone. And the two men that really saw 
what Australia could be, Higgins and ISEX had taken, taken over. Now, from, from my recollection of, of being at law school and doing industrial law and being an employment lawyer, uh, the Constitution was always fascinating. We always had such meat to chew on through the Constitution and Section 5135, and we did a whole lot of study on that. And unfortunately, work choices wiped all that uh, away. Now, the engineer's case arose out of a dispute uh, of, uh, it was a, 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 led by a union of engineers, and they'd lodged a application for uh, an award. And part of that was a Western Australian government uh, issue where some of their employees uh, were caught up in that dispute. So the issue was about how you can make a federal award under section uh, 5135. Isaac saw this as his opportunity to stamp his authority and change the way that the Constitution uh, was looked at. As a matter of uh, interest, Geoffrey Sawyer, uh, the chap who wrote the book, has said that the Joint Judgment in Engineers is one of the worst written and worst organised in Australian judicial history. Uh, Isaacs was given to rhetoric, repetition, and here he gave his habits full reign. It's a very difficult judgment to read. It's very difficult to extract the main issues uh, out of it. Isaacs looked at a clause of the Constitution, section 109, and we all know 109, but for some reason the High Court judges had entirely forgotten that during the first 20 years uh, of federation. But uh, in industrial law, going through those constitutional cases in the, nine, in the uh, uh, history of federation, you just know automatically about 109. Now in the paper I say that, that Isaacs, who was a difficult man himself, threw the previous judges completely under a bus. He said that the previous decisions had been based on a vague individual conception of the spirit of the compact, which is the result, not the result of interpreting any specific language to be quoted, nor referable to any recognised principle of the common law of the Constitution. Knew nothing, previous judges knew nothing. Just completely threw the previous judges under the bus. In fact, I, I, when I was reading it, I thought this is quite a rude decision. He had no respect for previous uh, authority. He based his decision on two things. One was that there's a common sovereignty to all parts of the British Empire. And secondly, the other is the principle of responsible government. The previous judges had based their decisions on American precedents. Isaacs took a different path and he said, no, what we need to look at is Australia has responsible government, the ministers sit in parliament, uh, and this, this very vague, again, vague conception of the sovereignty of all parts of the British Empire. So Isaacs makes a very great change. And overnight, what happens is, for example, that the Commonwealth power is greatly increased. Uh, so I, I think the, I put some figures in that um, in 1920, uh, there were 670,000 unionists who work under the state award and only 100,000 under the Commonwealth. And then by 1924, there were 550,000 people covered by Commonwealth awards. So it had a real impact on uh, how the Commonwealth operated. Okay, so I quote a little about uh, section um, uh, 107 uh, of the Constitution. Uh, and Isaac said, it was fundamental and a fatal flaw to read section 107 as reserving any power to the states that the Commonwealth might have fairly have had. So the states were reduced to having powers of well, firstly, the Commonwealth had to be determined for what powers it had, and then the states came second, rather than the other way uh, around. So engineers came to use a constitutional method of interpretation 
um, in which the words of the Constitution became very important. Now, we, we still use these uh, examples of um, uh, statutory interpretation, uh, and I'll give you a quote about how Samuel Griffiths, the Chief Justice, first saw how to read the Constitution, and then we can compare it to Isaacs and Dixon, uh, who favoured uh, a literal interpretation. Uh, so Griffiths didn't want to just pick up uh, the Constitution and read it merely by the aid of a dictionary, as by an astral intelligence, and as a mere decree of the Imperial Parliament without reference to history. So these chaps are sitting there, they're thinking about the convention debates, they're thinking about what part they took place in it, the first High Court judges, and they're using that frame of reference, they're using that frame of reference to inter interpret uh, the Constitution. So engineers was groundbreaking, and the states really saw it as quite a revolutionary, uh, a revolutionary act uh, that breached their sovereign rights, and they were quite resentful uh, of uh, the decision. I mean, looking from the historical vantage point, it just must have been so self-evident that if you're a High Court judge, you've made the Constitution, you've taken parts, part in the debates, you would naturally see the states as being the more important partner. So it took a little bit of time for that to uh, come out of the system uh, and have some of the, the newer men, Isaacs and Higgins, and later Dixon, uh, come and uh, uh, turn it on its head. So Dixon's appointed in 1929. Engineers has had nine years to go, but Dixon felt that engineers had taken things a bit too far. And when you read engineers, uh, there, there's just no limitation that uh, Isaacs had placed uh, on the power of the Commonwealth. Uh, so Dixon saw that it was his role in order to bring it back. So Dixon's appointed in 1929 at the time when the Depression hits. So some of these cases that I'll mention uh, should be seen in that light of it being historical uh, development uh, as much as a legal development. So Wall Street's crashing. 30% unemployment in Australia, and we've just come out of a buoyant mood following the end of the war, and everything crashes. Dixon, by the way, was put on the bench at, at the age of 42 as a High Court judge. Quite a, quite a, um, an overachiever. Uh, Dixon had sat in the Victorian Supreme Court uh, as well. Um, he'd been to the Privy Council, um, and he was quite reluctant to take the position on the High Court in any event. He was earning quite a great deal of money, and money was always very important to him, given his family circumstances. He also knew of the trouble on the High Court uh, bench as well, because none of the judges seemed to get on with each other. And uh, that, that followed all the way up through uh, Chief Justice Latham to, to Chief Justice Barwick. In 1927 as well, just as an aside, uh, Dixon had taken part in a Royal Commission. And there was a Royal Commission into the operation of the Constitution of the Commonwealth. So he'd already given his views through the Victorian Bar Association as early as 1927. He spoke about the separation of powers, which presaged his decision in Boilermakers. Uh, he dealt with um, Section 92, um, the trade and commerce power, that trade and commerce should be absolutely free, etc. Uh, so he wasn't that much of an unknown quantity. He's made his views known already on the Constitution. Uh, but his first foray was the Australian Railway Union case in 1930. Again, another industrial arbitration case, and the railway uh, commissioners, in this case, wanted to reduce wages for staff. They wanted to reduce it, given the strictures that were in place for the financial issues, that the states um, had, had met. So then, this is Dixon's first opportunity to look at uh, engineers, uh, and immediately he puts his stamp on matters. The first decision he wrote, just as a matter of interest, he wrote for Justice Rich, and he hadn't even sat on the case. He just took the papers and wrote it for George Rich, without even having heard any uh, of the arguments. OK, so in the Australian Railway Union's case, uh, Dixon puts this gloss onto engineers. 
uh, that he says that every grant of legislative power to the Commonwealth should be interpreted as authorising the Parliament to make laws affecting the operations of the states and their agencies. Engineers. And if the state is not acting in the exercise of the Crown's prerogative. So that's the first carve out that Dixon makes, that uh, the Commonwealth Parliament cannot affect the Crown in the right of the state. So anything to do with the ministries, anything to do with the MPs, anything to do with parliaments, the Commonwealth has absolutely no role in. The states are still their sovereign uh, entities. He also says the states can't be discriminated against, but that's quite an aside. So when you look at the span of Dixon's judgments, he's just planted this little seed there that the Commonwealth cannot discriminate against the states. And we'll get to that when we talk about uh, Melbourne Corporation. The next time that he has cause to look at this particular issue is in Western, the, Com the Commissioner of Taxation. And I've just put into the paper exactly what that case is about. And if you're still awake after uh, when I read it, then you can get a job on the, uh, the High Court. Now, Latham, the Chief Justice says, regarding Western, the Commissioner of Taxation, the question which arises upon this case stated, is whether monies received by a retired federal public servant by way of a pension under the Superannuation Act 1922 to 1934 are subject to the taxation under the Special Income and Wages Tax Management Act 1933 of New South Wales. Imagine sitting on that High Court case. That would have been a bit dry and dull. Okay, so uh, Dixon, again, uh, with his flourish, starts thinking about, well, what impact does this have on the Commonwealth and the state powers? And Dixon takes a slightly different view this time. He's starting to think about what does the Commonwealth Constitution look like? What's its fabric? What's its structure? What can I glean from how it is actually set out and established? So he's looking at the implications. Now, the implications under the previous decisions was an implication about reserve powers. It was an implication about what can uh, the implied prohibitions, what can state governments do and what can federal governments do. So he says, uh, since the engineer's case, a notion seems to have gained currency that in interpreting the constitution, no implications can be made. Such a method of construction would defeat the intention of any instrument but of all instruments, a written constitution seems the last to which it should be applied. I do not think the judgment of the majority of the court in the engineer's case meant to propound such a doctrine. He then goes on to say that there's little justification for seeking to find, in the engineer's case, authority for more than what was decided. He's throwing Isaac Isaacs under a bus. He's saying, really, let's just have a think about what engineers actually meant, meant and really bringing it back down uh, to earth. So Dixon's saying that there is implications that can be made, just not the implications that the previous high courts uh, had indulged in. It's quite a withering judicial commentary to read, and the lucidity of Dixon in his writing should be compared to Isaac's because you see two men with very, very different styles. So he repeats the reservations that he's got uh, in this particular case, that you, the Commonwealth government cannot affect the state governments with their prerogative rights under the Crown. Uh, and he also says that you cannot affect the states when it comes to their uh, uh, discrimination. Now, Dixon read the Constitution as being a federalist document and uh, uh, he read down the engineer's case um, and he didn't re-enliven in any of the previous issues. He didn't even need to go back there. He had his own view of it and his view uh, came to have absolute sway uh, over time. In 1947, he then has another case to have a look at in Essendon Corporation. And there's one matter that I just want to raise there. And again, it's historical reference before we deal a bit with Melbourne Corporation. And that is, in the Essendon case, he relies very heavily on American citations. So just to draw it back, under Diemden and Pedder and those line of cases, 
Barton, no Connor, uh, used American references. They were very, very strong on that. After engineers, Isaacs ditches any reference to the American Constitution. He goes back to relying on English authority. And now we've come to Dixon in the later years, in the 30s and 40s, and he's back to quoting American precedents. And one of the precedents that Tom mentioned earlier, the case of the Sar Saratoga Springs, uh, was written uh, by uh, a chap uh, in the American Supreme Court, Justice uh, uh, Frankfurt. And he was a great friend of Dixon's. And when Dixon went to the United States as the American, um, as the Australian ambassador to the United States, they got together. So when Dixon comes back, he's got a whole lot of American authorities in his mind. He's been, he's visited the American uh, courts uh, and he's, he's much influenced uh, by that. Um, as a matter of interest, it wasn't a conservative that sent Dixon to Washington, it was uh, John Curtin that sent Dixon to Washington as a non-partisan ambassador. He searched for someone that uh, was, was just not allied to either side um, of politics. Okay, so now we come to state banking case, Melbourne Corporation. And this case is again one of those seminal moments in Australian history. It's post the Second World War. Uh, Curtin has died and Chifley is the Prime Minister. And Chifley, back in the 1930s, had uh, been very, very strong on nationalising the banks. One of the, one of the founding principles of the Labor Party. So when Chifley becomes Prime Minister, he has his first attempt at nationalising the banks. It was meant to be an extension of the wartime powers, uh, but essentially what Chifley wanted to do through Section 48 of the Banking Act was he wanted to say to the state governments that they couldn't bank with the bank of their choice. He was saying to local authorities, you can't bank with the bank of your choice. Now, it's not like today where we've got the four pillars, the four banks who, who form the pillars. We had state banks. We had banks that were completely independent, smaller, and the state governments did business with their own state bank. And what Chifley said was, you're not going to be able to do that anymore. Section 48 prohibited the banks from taking deposits from government entities. Now, for some reason, it had not occurred to anybody to really think about what was the most important part of this. Treasury sends out a note in 1947, May 1947, reminding the state governments they cannot bank with anybody but the Commonwealth Bank of Australia. So the Melbourne City Council uh, retains Barwick and they head off to the High Court and the case was heard on the 13th of August 1947. It was quite a short uh, case uh, by modern standards, but it needed to be decided quickly because the legislation was going to, going to commence and the state banks were going to lose all of their uh, big uh, clientele. So Dixon uh, is, the main, uh, is the main man who gives his decision. It's a relatively short judgment, uh, but I've indicated that it's lucid, it's pithy, it's engaging. This is a man who knows the legal method. So he's, he starts off by saying what the question for decision is. And he says, the question for our decision is whether in the exercise of the power to make laws with respect to banking, other than state banking, the incorporation of banks and the issue of paper money, quote the Constitution, the Commonwealth Parliament may forbid banks, except the Commonwealth Bank and state banks, to conduct any banking business for a state, save by the consent of the Federal Treasurer. So the Federal Treasurer was going to govern who people could bank with. Now, for the states, that was a bridge too far. And Dixon took up an earlier line that he'd mentioned before, and that was focusing on the discrimination of the states. Dixon looks at and compares what would happen under a unitary, unitary system, and he says, quote, under a unitary constitutional system, there's no legal difficulty in giving effect to such a policy or in carrying it as far down the line of public authorities as may be desired. 
but it is otherwise in a federal system. State and federal governments are separate bodies politic and prima facie each controls its own monies. And Dixon puts a stop to this form of bank nationalisation. He quotes the unitary system because of course he's a very well read and rehearsed man and he's looked at the British issue and they're a unitary system and that's fine if you want to impose uh, central banking. But under a federal system, the federal state, uh, federal entities uh, cannot impact on the state entities if it discriminates against them. Because the effect that it had was that the states couldn't bank with their chosen bank, but you and I could bank with the, our chosen bank. So it discriminated against the state entities. That's what Dixon was saying. Now, Dixon takes the prima facie rule and he talks about how the federal laws uh, can impact on the states. And he says the prima facie rule is that a power to legislate with respect to a given subject enables the parliament to make laws which upon that subject affect the operation of the states and their agencies, engineers. And then he says, with this dreary feeling, he says that, as I've pointed out more than once, is the effect of engineers case stripped of embellishment and reduced to the form of a legal proposition. Again, that's quite a withering judicial commentary on, uh, uh, on Isaacs. It's a subject, however, to certain reservations, and this also I have repeatedly said. So you get this idea that Dixon said it all before, he's been called upon to say it again, and wearily he's going through uh, the motions. But Melbourne Corporation, this case was his most lucid judgment uh, in this particular uh, area. The critical point uh, that Dixon lands on is that the federal system itself is the foundation of the restraint upon the use of power to control the states. Indeed, it's written into the very fabric of the Constitution, the very fabric uh, of the Constitution. Dixon is, is saying in Melbourne corporations that the states do have their own individual life to lead. They're not going to be governed by the Commonwealth Government. And subject to the reservations, the Commonwealth can do whatever it wants under, under the enumerated powers, but the states also need to continue uh, their existence. Dixon also then talks again about the implications uh, that can be made. Uh, and he, he didn't shy away from that. He knew that the implications and implying words into the Constitution were not terribly, uh, uh, were frowned upon by some people. Uh, but the implication is there. The states must exist. There was a couple of other cases that I just wanted to mention which compares and contrasts uh, Dixon's um, achievements in uh, the railways case, Melbourne Corporation, West uh, and um, Essendon. Um, and it's just an indication of how we consider Barwick today. And when I first started this paper, uh, I was going to give a commentary on what we think of Owen, Sir Owen Dixon today. Um, but then it just became too broad. Dixon has said so many things about so many areas of law that it would become a book in itself. So I just want to briefly talk about work choices, talk about uh, Williams, and we'll see how those sorts of cases um, have either affected Dixon's view or not. So work choices, again, another industrial case which severely affected uh, people um, in their practices in 2006. Um, there might be some wry smiles. Essentially, prior to work choices, we had a system where the state governments uh, had their own industrial relations system. New South Wales was a vibrant and lively and world-leading institution in the development of law, development of workers, uh, uh, work health and safety, and of course the unfair contracts jurisdiction. The Commonwealth had their power to make federal awards which covered a very large number of employees. But that was done under the conciliation and arbitration power, section 5135. Howard, John Howard, took the view that the Commonwealth should be looking at controlling industrial relations through the corporation's power, 
and using conciliation arbitration for some other areas. Now that, that, um, that piece of legislation was taken to the High Court uh, and over an eye-watering 914 paragraphs, Chief Justice Gleeson uh, and uh, other members of the bench said, no, corporations' power can be used to regulate industrial relations in this country. So overnight, almost overnight, the state power to set industrial relations and make state awards, and state unfair dismissals and state unfair contracts went. The jurisdiction ended uh, almost over, overnight. The High Court was faced with this particular argument that to take industrial relations off the state governments was to upset the federal balance. So the state governments went and argued that uh, to take for such a drastic action was going to uh, was going to change the federal balance. Now the judges of the High Court uh, said that it was quite an amorphous concept. What is the federal balance? We don't have any idea what the federal balance that the states are talking about might be. And indeed, it was, uh, I think, um, Justice Hayne who said that the applicants in that case had failed to put forward what their view of the federal balance was. It was devoid of content. It was really just turning up to the High Court and saying, please save our power. But as Dixon said, once you've found the head of power, section 5135, that gives you power to do everything in relation to those areas, save for affecting the states, discriminating against the states, and there was simply no discrimination uh, in this case. Uh, interestingly, um, uh, Justice uh, Susan Kenney, who was writing extrajudicially, um, she said, and I quite agree, that the history of the Commonwealth has really led to this position we are in. It's the, it's the nationhood aspect that we are really now focusing on. And was work choices necessary to progress Australia? Well, I think there's an argument to have everybody under the same set of industrial laws was a great leap forward. It affected us as barristers because there was a workload that um, automatically dried up. Um, however, as a step forward towards uh, full nationhood, having everyone under the same laws, I can't disagree. Uh, finally, I just wanted to deal uh, with a matter that goes the other way, and that is the Williams and the Commonwealth of Australia, the school chaplains case. Now, in that case, there were two of them in 2012 and 2014, dealt with the power of the federal government to expend funds on whatever it liked. And in this particular case, the federal government uh, wanted to give states and state schools money to spend on religious education, to fund school chaplains to be in schools. And a brave chap called Williams didn't like this idea. His daughters were attending a school in Queensland and uh, he was permitted by the High Court to argue that the Commonwealth spending money on anything that it liked so long as, as it was supported by a head of power, was going a step too far. So in Williams and the Commonwealth, the High Court was very, very certain in saying that Melbourne Corporation was not to be called into question. Melbourne Corporation was absolute authority, and if anyone wanted to argue against Melbourne Corporation, then they were going to face serious uh, issues. Uh, but ultimately, the court, alighting on section 61 of the Constitution, said that um, that particular power did not authorise government expenditure, uh, even though there was an enumerated power to support it. The court held that it was unconstitutional for the Commonwealth to spend monies uh, in areas beyond the day-to-day -day running of the federal government. And school chaplains in schools is beyond what it takes to run the federal government. Uh, so, um, in summary, um, Dixon is still with us today. Um, as Tom has indicated, books are still being written, there are papers still being written. Uh, we're still talking about the effect that Sir Rowan Dixon has had.
and from man born in 1886, being put on the High Court in 1929 and leaving in 1964, his legacy is still with us today and it's arguable that the stamp that he put on the Commonwealth and common, Commonwealth powers is largely governing how we are living as a federation today. So it's been a great experience to have a look at these issues. Uh, the interplay of history and politics is always uh, fascinating. Um, and if you've got any questions, be happy to answer them. Thank you.